Welcome to Authors in Conversation with me, Ian Martin. I'm editor of Reaction. I'm delighted to say I'm joined today by Michael Crick. Now, Michael, I was going to introduce you as a distinguished journalist, but I have to say when I'm ever introduced as that, I always say that it's a contradiction in terms. But you are the author of this, One Party After Another, The Disruptive Life of Nigel Farage. Michael, Farage is a Marmite figure. Some people hate him, some people love him. And he has his fans. But how significant do you think he's been as a political figure? Very significant. I'd, I'd say he's one of the last, uh, of, if you take my adult lifetime, the last 40 years, he's one of the top five, I'd say. And I, I think there's a case to say that in this century, in other words, the last 22 years, he is the most influential figure. Uh, broadly, for two, two reasons. Obviously, his role in Brexit, which I think is crucial. Um, but also, secondly, I would, I would, second, I would ask, I would argue that the 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 Red Wall roadmap that brought Boris Johnson uh, a huge majority uh, three years ago, eighty majority three years ago, mm. was really planned by Farage and UKIP and Brexit. They, uh, you know, softened up the Labour vote who would have been reluctant to vote Conservative. You know, and my my father would spin in his grave. I voted Conservative, so you you vote UKIP first, then you vote for Brexit in the referendum, then maybe you vote for the Brexit Party, and finally in 2019, millions of them then vote uh, Labour, which looks like a transformation really in electoral politics. The Conservatives in 2019 became the working class party, Labour the middle class party. Whether it stays that way, who knows? But so that is a, a, something I would attribute to Farage that people don't often talk about because he realized that UKIP in the noughties, in the 90s before that, weren't going to get very far just on the votes of retired colonels on the south coast in, in, in home counties golf clubs because they were dying out for one reason. Mm. But actually, there was this great new uh, group of people totally disaffected with politics and with Labour who were there for the taking uh, if only it happened in the right way, which it, of course it did. Through the means of the of UKIP, then the Brexit Party, and then sorry, then then the the referendum, and then the Brexit Party. And he does it without becoming an MP. He tries how many times? Is it seven, eight, nine? Seven I forget. Five. Yeah. And, and he, I don't think uh, I think Farage reached the conclusion in the end, and I'd agree that he was never going to get elected an MP because what happened in some of the later elections is that the big two, Labour and the Conservatives, would gang up on him, uh, and that certainly happened in South Thanet. That basically Labour decided not to run a serious campaign in South Thanet, uh, even though it had been a Labour constituency only five years earlier. It was a Labour constituency up to 2010. Then they lost it to the Conservatives, Laura Sands. And the way that, and early on in that campaign, sort of April, early April, you know, it looked like a three-way race, but then Labour, Labour's campaign collapsed. Conservatives piled in all the money and people and everything. And Farage couldn't win in those circumstances. And that probably would have happened if he decided to run in 2017 or 2019 or, or, or another by-election as well. So it's this, mm. and the, one of the great ironies, of course, of the whole story is that the whole of Farage's success and UKIP's success, and then the Brexit party, is all founded on the fact that the Labour government back in 99, under pressure from the Liberal Democrats, brought in PR for the European elections, as uh, was was asked for by the rest of Europe, but the Labour could have resisted it probably, and it very nearly didn't happen because the House of Lords tried to. They blocked it six times, and Jack Straw was all for abandoning it. And Blair said, "No, no, no, we've got to push through PR because uh, I've got Paddy Ashan on my back. We have broken all these promises about bringing in uh, Liberal Democrats into government, uh, which had secretly been going on. Um, and so the, the result was PR in '99. Farage is one of the first MEPs elected, three of them for UKIP, and then it went on and on, and they got more and more. And of course, that brought in more loads of money." Uh, although they claimed they weren't going to fiddle their expenses or anything. Oh, yeah. Uh, and it brought, gave them a platform, uh, gave them a certain respectability, and it you know transformed the scene. Yeah. Within yeah. UKIP, importantly, Farage had argued to abandon... UKIP used to have an abstentionist policy, like Sinn Féin, a bit like Sinn Féin, that they would, get, they, would run, they would fight the elections, but if they got elected, they wouldn't participate in the parliament. Or like the S like the SNP in the House of Lords, so they just sort of stand back from this terrible institution that yeah. they hate. And, and and Farage overturned that because he he could see what was happening, and he could see that actually the European Parliament had had its uses. 
So they weren't interested in sitting on committees. Uh, I mean, they did. Some of them did, and some of them didn't. But uh, but the, but the key was it it brought them in masses of money, millions of money, particularly once you start forming groups with other Eurosceptic parties, and that was then all ploughed into the UKIP's campaign. And Farage also had the, the brilliant ability to, you know, in a European Parliament, my, my, a lot of speeches are restricted to just ninety seconds. Uh, I mean, you know, Westminster MPs would be horrified. But Farage learnt the ability. To, to, to have 90 seconds of really punchy sound bites. And that then, and then he also had the ability to spot that YouTube was a great place to uh, put these uh, speeches. And they got coverage throughout Europe and were, were spotted in, by a lot of uh, mm. conservatives in America, including Donald Trump. So let's go right back to the beginning, uh, the origins of, of Nigel Farage. Now, I was very struck reading your book by the way in which he, he represents a very particular kind of England, isn't it? it? It's the England of the home counties working in the city as a trader, straight from school, um, uh, Dulwich. And then it, it, it also has a, it has a quality that's sort of toad of toad hall, fishing, beer, ye olde England. Put all that together and it's a very, very particular England, quite a long way removed from the Red Wall, actually. But tell me about his, his beginnings. Well, I mean, he's he comes from a middle class background, quite a political background, you know, sort of right wing con nationalistic uh, conservatives. Um, they lived in a place called um, a Down, D-O-W-N-E, which is a, 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 it's like a village. It's like a rural English village on the edge of Greater London, actually in Greater London. It's where Darwin lived for 40 years in the 19th century. And indeed, the Farages lived on the other side of Darwin Garden Wall. And, and Farage used to explore the grounds of Down House where Darwin lived. And it's, uh, you know, he, he was a mile from Biggin Hill with all its uh, Second World War history. You know, only a few miles from Chartwell. And it's, it's, and it's so raw. And he used to roam the fields on his own. And he would collect and forage for, you know, old bits of pottery and, 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 and pebbles and or, or bottles and, and all, collect all these, he still got them all. Um, and, but this was within London, you know, this was London commuter belt, quite difficult to get from down on public transport to the city, but Farage's father uh, and his father before him were both stockbrokers. And Farage uh, himself became not a stockbroker, but a, uh, a trader. And of course the city of London has got this mix of classes. Uh, of, of you know upper class type, middle class type, and work. A lot of a lot of Britain, a lot of Britain is very class divided. Whereas the city of London, you have to operate with all classes, and I think that was part of Farage's success. He gets on with people of all backgrounds. Uh, he and he uh, uh, and so that, of course, uh, you know, it was a huge help when it came to his political career. And unlike most politicians, Farage loves talking to people. I mean, Boris Johnson doesn't really like talking to people that much on the street, unless they're going to say how wonderful he is and give him a kiss and take a smoke. He doesn't want to talk politics with people on the street. Farage loves talking politics with people on the street. He can get on with working class, old ladies, whatever, mm. and he can get up on with the upper classes in gentlemen's clubs. Um, and of course, Farage is a bundle of contradictions. You know, here is this great iconoclast revolutionary trying to bring down, uh, you know, our membership of the European Union uh, primarily, but other things as well. Uh, and and yet he's desperate to join the establishment in many ways. You know, yeah. nobody is a more assiduous attender of old boys events at his, his, his private school, Dulwich College in South London, than Nigel Farage. He frequently turns up in this, this garish Dulwich College blaze. Uh, you know, he was desperate. He's desperate to be nominated, at least, to the House of Lords and to be nominated for a night. Whether he'd take them, I don't know. Uh, and he, you know, he's terribly upset when the government, he goes to see Trump the day after, the week after Trump's election, the first uh, British politician to meet Trump uh, since he was elected. And, he, and when he comes back, the, he hears nothing from the Foreign Office. He hears nothing from Downing Street. And he's furious. <laughs> and, you know, so he wants, he wants the, stat, the establishment to recognise him. He loved being... You know, as a leader of a group in the European Parliament, but the Eurosceptic group, which kept evolving with, you know, all sorts of unsavoury characters in it at times, from you know, racists from Poland and, and so on, anti-Semites. Um, but he loved being the leader of the group because it gave him status, it gave him more money, um, and it gave him a place on the front bench of the European uh, of the hemicycle, mm. the parliamentary chamber. 
sitting right next to the president of the European Commission. And he and Juncker <laughs> were great mates, really. They'd always hug and kiss each other. And uh, only five days after the referendum, there's a photo in the book of, of Farage and Juncker together. So that's the beauty of the subject. It's it's complex. Yeah. But it's not it's never dull. It's never does never no. a dull bit with Farage. No. And he um let's let's just let's go back and just ask where his politics comes from. So he's 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 in the city, he's having he's very long lunches, he's he's starting to make his way. He could have if he'd stayed in the city, he would have, and he always says that his contemporaries stayed and made lots and lots of money. But politics really grabs him. Why? Well, partly because, I mean, he's always been interested in politics. He loved politics since school. You know, he, uh, Sir Keith Joseph and Enoch Powell were uh, two of the visitors to the Dulwich, Dulwich College. Very, Dulwich College, because it's in South London, found it very easy to get big name politicians. And Farage was struck by, he loved debating. You know, in the, in, from the very first, the early days, he loved debating in, in class. And uh, if he wasn't picked for the, for, to propose the motion, he'd then put his hand up and offer to oppose the motion instead. <laughs> um, and uh, so he loved, he loved taking both sides of it, you know, as an exercise. Uh, and his family was quite political as well, um, although didn't actually uh, get involved. He, I mean, you know, he's, a, he's basically a, a, a right-wing conservative. He's a Thatcherite. He thought Thatcher was... Uh, wonderful, and he was a member of the. He joined the party when he was still at school, um, but he became very, very euro sceptic. Um, uh, you know, after the Big Bang and the, and the city and European uh, regulations coming in, and then of course you've got uh, joining the RM and uh, Black Monday and all of that, Black Wednesday and all of that, and so um, and and that really affected him. And I mean, in 1989, he actually voted green in the European elections, mm. which I suppose partly reflects the sort of the the conservationist side, conservationist side of Farage, um, uh, but also the fact that the Greens in in, in those days were Eurosceptic. I mean, they believed in, in leaving the European Union. It's, but yeah. Actually, every party in Britain has believed in Europe, leaving the EU at some point, apart from the Lib Dem. And um, so uh, it, it evolved. And essentially, he still is a conservative. I mean, indeed, while he was. Um, uh, an MEP in 2004, Archie Norman decided after one term he was going to give up being uh, an MP. He'd been uh, the boss of Asda, as you know. And he tried to get uh, the Conservatives to, to get the Conservative candidature for, for Tunbridge Wells and uh, was rebuffed by Sir Paul Beresford, the MP, who told him, look, you've got to go through all the procedures. First of all, you've got to leave UKIP, then you've got to join the Conservative Party and all of that. And it, it, it got nowhere. But it was, it was a sign of Farage's thinking. Uh, and, a fa and a, fa a sign of how he didn't really think UKIP was going to work at that stage. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, if um, Farage is in incredibly popular with the Conservative grassroots. I mm -hmm. mean, there was a poll, I think, a couple of years ago that said 54% of Conservative activists would be happy to see Farage as their leader. Um, and, of course, in some ways, uh, Boris Johnson is, is the party's answer yeah. uh, to Farage. So, uh, yeah. the, But his, his, that, that ambition, you... you, you... Yeah. Hinted at it there, that ambition all along to get Britain out of the EU. When he begins that, when his political career begins, it seems like the most outlandish position. Of course, you said the Greens well, 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 approved well, well, of it and there were there were strands of various parties. But the idea in both of the main parties of it ever happening, it just if we'd gone back 20, 30 years, it would have seemed bonkers. Uh, indeed. And, uh, um, you know, the, the, he, he was one of the early members, the, the founders of... Uh, what became UKIP, called the Anti-Federalist League in 1992. And there were hardly any Conservative MPs in those days who would openly say, I want to leave the European Union. I mean, they might say it privately. Um, and it was a really minority view in those days. But there was a lot of discontent, nevertheless. There was, well, you know, Euroscepticism in those days meant you, you, weren't, you were very unhappy with the European Union. Um, and um, but of course, other people were starting to gather this, including Jimmy Goldsmith. And the best thing that ever happened to Farage and UKIP was that although Goldsmith, uh, you know, put an amazing campaign on in '97 and trounced UKIP by about eight to one, although I mean, I think they spent 28 million on it or something. The, probably the most, <laughs> the, the most that any party spent on, on an election up to that point. Fact, astonishingly, Goldsmith died only a few weeks after that election, and effectively. The referendum party merged with UKIP, and it became UKIP became much stronger um, mm. a, a, as a result. 
uh, sorry, I'm straying a long way from your question and I now forget what yeah, you're saying it was a minority thing. Yeah, it was very much a minority thing. The other thing, the other great irony of the story is that Farage never believed uh, in a referendum as the route towards Brexit. I mean, if you talk to Richard North, who was one of his, uh, I mean, Farage falls out with everybody in the end, <laughs> but one of his advisors, Richard North, who's a, a bit, had been a lifelong Eurosceptic and environmentalist, um, and worked with him in the European Parliament, says that Farage's way to Brexit was to, I mean, it seems astonishing that anybody could have this view, but <laughs> now, uh, but he believed, well, what we do is we get some UKIP MEPs, uh, MPs elected at, uh, at, at parliamentary by-elections, and then they team up with, uh, you know, Eurosceptics in the Conservative Party and a few from Labour, and eventually the bloc's big enough to bring about, get, get a vote in the House of Commons. I just can't see how that would have ever worked in a million yeah. years. But um, and when people in UKIP, notably when Nikki Sinclair, who actually had left UKIP by then, but she was an MEP, Nikki Sinclair, who's um, uh, famous for being, I think, the first transgender parliamentarian, but uh, she uh, spotted in 2010 a new provision uh, uh, in the um, constitutional measures brought in by the coalition, whereby if you got a petition of 100,000 names, then uh, you could have a referendum on that, as uh, you could have a debate on that subject in Parliament. So she put out a politician saying, we want an in-out referendum on Europe. And she went around the country in her van, getting uh, her caravan, getting 100,000 names. And uh, Farage uh, rubbished this and told people not to sign it. Mm. And she then embarrassed him on the, and when she got a debate, she embarrassed him on the, on College Green, uh, uh, on front of the cameras on live telly, here, Nigel, you haven't signed it yet. Why don't you do so? <laughs> And that was the debate, if you remember, where 86 Conservatives rebelled and yeah. Cameron realised actually the strength, the growing strength of Euroscepticism, Euroscepticism in the sense of, you know, actually wanting to lead yeah. uh, uh, in, in his party at that stage. And, and uh, Something was stirring. And it, it's also, isn't it, it's related, it's related to the Lisbon Treaty uh, mm. row in which you had this situation where there had been a campaign, Dan Hannan and others ran it, the Telegraph was very involved in it, in campaigning when Gordon Brown was prime minister for a referendum on the Lisbon Treaty, and it didn't work. Despite attracting lots of signatures and there being rallies, it just never really caught caught fire. I remember people, people as a columnist going to sit, sit through some of the meetings and it just didn't quite take off. So Farage, Farage would say, well, look at that, that didn't work. So it's not, it, 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 you know, it's not going to work subsequent to that. I mean, also another important development at this, at this uh, you know, we're talking about the late noughties, was were two important developments that Farage managed to see off two rival parties mm. um, from left and right. He saw off the BNP, who in the late noughties, uh, it, during the first years of Farage's first period of leadership, uh, were hammering the uh, UKIP in by-elections. I mean, Henley on Thames, the B BNP vote was twice UKIP's. Extraordinary, think about it now. And the, it was same happening all over the place under the new leadership of Nick Griffin. And that, um, it really looked bad, like bad news for UKIP. And there was serious thought about, do we do a pact with the BNP or whatever? Um, and Farage managed to see off the people in his party who were arguing for that. And then the amazing accident occurred where, from his point of view, of uh, the MPs' expenses scandal, which really discredited any party that was in Westminster. Well, there's a, lo there's a lovely phrase in the book, which you, you describe it as, where you say, for once, there was something to be gained from having no MPs. Yes, exactly. And, and of course, UKIP then, uh, in the Euro elections of 2009, uh, instead of plummeting in the vote, which everybody had expected, uh, we actually got more seats because everybody was saying, I'm not voting Labour, Conservative or Lib Dem. Uh, and, and they had become uh, the, the repository of those people disgusted by the MPs' expenses scandal, even though they were the biggest fiddlers of expenses of them all within the European Parliament. But voters didn't know that. And then the, um, almost immediately a year later, uh, the Liberal Democrats, by joining the, poli the coalition, effectively resigned as the natural party of protest in uh, British politics. Uh, and uh, it was natural for UKIP to fill the gap. And by then, the BNP and Nick Griffin had been seen off partly by the Euro elections, but partly also by the disastrous appearance on uh, Question Time. Um, and so it was then that the Farage and UKIP was, were during the course of that parliament, the, the 2010 to 2015 parliament, not, not, not very quickly to start with, but in, after about 18 months, suddenly 
they started getting amazing votes in by-elections, terrifying the Conservatives, and who were losing Tory voters. You know, Tory and local officials were voting UKIP. Well, you know, I, I, I think, almost, you know, there were large numbers, actually, frankly, of MPs who were probably voting for, for UKIP in the Euro elections of 14. And, uh, and, 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 pa and pan Cameron panicked uh, in all sorts of ways. And one thing led to another. And, and he and, and David, David, that. Yeah. David Cameron had been at, as much, a, I suppose, of the, the, the Tory leadership and Tory establishment, for want of a better term, had been had been really critical of UKIP. Cameron had his famous phrase about Farage's party, but you're yeah. absolutely right. In that in that period, yeah. Yeah. he realizes that he has to start taking the threat seriously. I suppose the other thing, which is the, the backdrop to it, is as you said, you identified MPs' expenses, but you've also had the financial crisis, and then you have the eurozone crisis. So suddenly, Europe is yeah. no longer the had those solution. Three, it starts like, to be a big problem. And and then of course immigration across the Mediterranean in 2014 and 15, which you know helps UKIP come top of the Euro polls, and you know it, it reached its peak in 2015 after the British general election. So to call a, a, a referendum uh, in early 2016, you know, was just about the worst time uh, to hold a referendum uh, given this very visible. Uh, issue of yeah. in vast numbers coming into Europe, uh, not across the Channel and Dinghies at that stage. And, you know, when you're talking about a referendum was won by 52, 52 to 48, uh, you know, that was that's, that's easily enough to make the, the, the difference. Yeah. And Cameron was, of course, boxed in, wasn't he? Well, he boxed himself in because he'd given this pledge in a manifesto and then it wasn't, it's not clear whether or not he actually thought he could win. He probably when he gave the pledge, he assumed that he'd be in another coalition with the Liberal but, Democrat, Democrats. So it probably wouldn't come to, uh, to a referendum. Know, you know, he'd done well. He'd won the Scottish referendum. And well, actually, the Scottish referendum was after the pledge. But he'd, 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 he'd won the AV referendum in 2011. True. He'd won the 2010, uh, well, at least won, uh, won it enough to <laughs> become prime minister. He'd done, he'd done the, he'd, he'd, had, he'd acquired a knack of winning elections or winning votes unexpectedly. And I, I'm sure he expected that, uh, you know, he'd be able to see it off. Yeah. Um, if, if indeed, it had to be done at all. Yeah. It, it, yeah. <laughs> quietly hoping that, as indeed it happened at, at various times during that government, you know, it, he, he rather welcomed the fact that the Lib Dems vetoed Conservative proposals. <laughs> but but this this brings it all back, actually, the intensity of that, that period. And the, it was fascinating to see it just dawn slowly on Cameron and the Tory leadership, the, the extent of the, the threat of what was coming post, post Eurozone yeah. uh, and, and crisis. You saw, you saw those uh, in 2014, uh, not only did the UKIP come top of the poll and you've got the defectors, uh, Cardwell and Reckless, and the extraordinary amounts of money and people that the Conservatives put into uh, win it, trying to win those by-elections in Newark and then um, Clacton and uh, Rochester and uh, Stroud. Uh, you know, and Cameron, for instance, visited Rochester and Stroud, the by-election, five times. I mean, if you went back over the previous 60 years of history, you'd probably only come across half a dozen times when prime ministers had visited a by-election once. And that they really did have uh, the Conservatives on the run. And it, in, and it was in ways that weren't always publicly visible. It was with, you know, donors, no long donors starting to donate to UKIP. Uh, local activists defecting and uh, and local or local officials quietly supporting you while carrying on being local officials. Yeah. And, and it's also there's the added there's the added um, uh, piquancy that this is being done to Cameron in his terms by people that he really doesn't hold in very high regard or respect. It's being done to him by Douglas Carswell, who have known from um, CCHQ and regarded as a bit of a, um, a nerd or a crank. It's being done to him by Mark Reckless. So it's just this, he's, he's deploying all of his resources of sort of charm and all the rest of it. And it and, and starting to realize that it's not, um, yeah. it's not working. But there's something else I wanted to ask you, just in talking about that period. There's, of course, there's money flowing in from, from some Tory donors and they're starting to lose by-elections. However, there's also a real 
how do I put this politely, a real whiff about UKIP, isn't there? And there's still at that point lots of Eurosceptics who don't want anything to do with uh, Nigel Farage or UKIP. Well, uh, and, and uh, understandably in that, um, uh, the, well, first of all, it was full of you know, huge oddballs. You know, people like Godfrey Blue, who, who would go around making remarks about Bongo Bongo land. And, uh, and of course, you know, there were many people throughout politics who regarded UKIP as a racist party and regarded uh, Farage as a racist um, and still do. Um, and my own view is that Farage himself, that, that obviously there are you know, a lot of racists in, in uh, the UKIP and, and less so the Brexit party, actually. Um, but that Farage himself was not a racist. He's, well, he's, he's a sort of, you know, an Edwardian Kipling-like, you know, Churchill at the time, English nationalist who believes mm. in the superi superiority of, you know, Englishness. But is that racism? I don't think it's racism in the, in the sense that we understand today. And there's, I mean, Alan Sked, who was the founder of UKIP uh, way back in 92, um, always told a story and he, you know, he repeated it in the press, goodness knows how many times in articles. He always recalled Farage saying at a UKIP meeting in the early 90s, oh, we don't need to worry about the black vote. The, and then he used an offensive word beginning with N, but not the normal one, another one that's got uh, uh, seven letters in it uh, and a hyphen in the middle. And he, uh, and uh, they, they'll never vote for us. And he uses that as to say, look, Farage was a ra uh, an appalling racist. And I, I, you know, obviously was interested in this and I spoke to Sked about it. And I, everybody I spoke to, I asked about this, you know, did Farage use that kind of language? Uh, have you ever heard him use that kind of language? Do you think Farage is a racist? And I spoke to goodness knows how many critics of Farage from from UKIP uh, because you know he's, he he he, genera he 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 generates uh, more and more critics all the time. You know he falls out with everybody. And to be to, you know they were all being to be fair they were all being all saying look I never heard Nigel using that kind of language. I he did all sorts of other terrible things, but he didn't do that. And I think that by but I don't think that Farage at heart is a he gets on very well with black people. He gets on very well with Jewish people. Um, and I, I think he was a terrible racist and anti-Semite at school, uh, at Dulwich College, and would say, you know, I mean, there's, you know, he would he would sidle up to Jewish boys and say, you lot should be gassed. And, you know, the most appalling stuff. Um, but that's at 13, 14, 15, 16. Does he, does he acknowledge that? that? I'm not sure you can hold that against somebody. Yeah. That, you know, we've done we've done terrible things at uh, we've all done terrible things as in our teens. Um, but um, but Michael, does it does he acknowledge does he acknowledge that or, or or he does really? He's never tried to deny that. And um, I mean, he, he uh, well, actually for the book, I put it to him again, and he said so. He came out with some remark about well, if you think that's terrible, what about the boys with red hair? You know, they they really got it, but which is sort of dismissing it uh, in a jokey way, but. He, I think he does acknowledge that he did do, he did, he, he was, and indeed, you know, at school, there was a campaign led by a teacher to try and stop him being a prefect because of his, she described him as a neo-Nazi. And, um, but that is, that is, that is then. And uh, I don't think he is a race, but I do think he and his party and uh, elements in, actually both referendum of Brexit campaigns in 2016, uh, pandered to, racists uh and um you know and i think the breaking point you can argue the breaking point poster uh is uh, an example of that and actually which which he was you you describe in the book he was skeptical about about that and um and of course the a lot of the fuss over the breaking point was generated because it happened only, it was only it was put on display only about three hours before joe Cox yeah. was uh, and that, and then the whole, all the state stuff came mixed up. But it, actually, at the end of the day, it, it looks like that didn't do the Brexit side any harm in that it, it put the, it, it, uh, it put the races, it, it, sorry, not it put the immigration issue back on the agenda. Although it had been slowly growing up the agenda, and even the vote leave, the sort of the official Brexit camp had been making more and more of the. Uh, immigration issue yeah um and uh you know michael gove and boris johnson in particular although johnson later later denied ever mentioning turkey 
which is complete rubbish. He did. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so you but you brought you brought us up to the referendum. So when that happens, there's going to be a referendum. Farage is absolutely determined that he is going to run it, and he's yeah. joined by how can I phrase this politely? A very colourful crew of people who kind of regard themselves as as japesters, donors, and supporters. Um, you know, Aaron Banks. Andy Wigmore, they are convinced that they're going to get the designation and that the, the referendum campaign must be run by Farage because Brexit is Nigel. And I remember, uh, I remember writing columns about this at the time and talking to them and talking to the various uh, leave camps and they just could not see that Farage was toxic for a lot of Euro Euro skeptics and a lot of people would have not necessarily voted, even voted to leave if Farage had got the designation. But why is he so determined? Is it purely ego? Well, I think it is. I mean, this, he is an enormous ego and he regards himself as, as Mr. Brexit. And actually, they didn't, they, they, they made a, they nearly, they nearly pulled it off in terms of getting the official designation, partly because the vote leave submitted their, their, their application late. And, and if the Electoral Commission had been strict about it, they could have, they might have been disqualified. Um, but actually, I think it was to the advantage of Brexit um, uh, that uh, you ended up with these two campaigns. Um, and uh, it was certainly to the advantage of Brexit that, that uh, Farage's lot uh, leave EU, although it was complicated because there's all series of groups, but it, that, that they didn't get the designation. Because what it meant was that people, people who are absolutely committed, all you know, lifelong Brexiteers or always wanted to leave the common market in the EU, you know, they would vote. They would say, "Ah, oh, well, you know, we've got Farage on on our side, and everything." And and yet, those who were more doubtful about it and uh, didn't, you know, were worried it would harm the economy and so on, would would look at the uh, vote leave and see that there was, you know, half a dozen cabinet ministers and Boris Johnson and so on, and that would then persuade them that it wasn't an outlandish uh, idea. Whereas in the previous referendum, the one in '75, I think, uh, well, admittedly that. You know that it was a two to one vote for yes, but I do think it harmed the, the anti EU or anti common market side then that uh, the the official you know the campaign the official no campaign was led by politicians regarded as extremists like Powell and Ben, whereas this time you had two groups and so it, it I think it widened the the appeal of the Brexit cause. Mm -hmm. uh, but having said that, I mean Dominic Cummings takes an alternative view and he says that. You know, it, it, it made a difference of six percent. Uh, and if it had, you know, if they'd just shut up and gone away, uh, and it just been vote leave, then we would have won it uh, more convincingly. I, I don't, yeah. I don't agree with Cummings on that. Uh, you, you, you do agree with him, or you, or you don't? I, don't. I, I do think that the advantage was having, uh, you know, uh, a, an absolutely committed uh, the, yeah. the, the barrage, uh, which is Matthew Elliott's position, who, who, yes, who, exactly. who also ran, you know, vote leave, leave with uh, Dominic yeah. Cummings, yeah. 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 Yeah, well, I mean, when the um, Leave wins, then it's not exclusively his victory, is it? Because it, no. it, because it's Boris Johnson who yeah. I'm always fascinated by his relationship with Boris Johnson. Boris Johnson really almost refuses to acknowledge acknowledge him. Wouldn't send him to the Lords. Avoids debating him. Avoids mentioning his name. Um, and is a bit and is in some ways certainly in the in, in the moment is a is a bigger bigger figure than Farage but do you think that hurts him that he doesn't he doesn't necessarily get all that credit in 2016 or blame as his enemies hugely, would say? I think it hugely hurts him yes and um, I mean if you mean hurt in, in the sense of that does he feel personal hurt yeah I mean I think this is one of the things that people don't realize about Farage he actually is quite an emotional guy he's also a very gloomy guy in t a lot of the time internally that you get again you don't see that you see all the hail and hearty oh you know wonderful uh, cheerful cheer cheer cheerful cheer, chappy sort of farage and yet he's racked by self doubt and he's racked by this view that you know people have got it in for him they don't give him the recognition he deserves um and uh and that of course is part of the appeal of america for him mm. because this is the period uh, immediately after the referendum, he then goes to the uh, Republican convention in in, uh, in America and he meets Trump's people. He then gets invited back to do a, a campaign rally for Trump, uh, gets involved with an argument with Hillary Clinton and, uh, you know, establishes a friendship with Trump very rapidly. 
him and earlier in the year he'd been expressing great skepticism about Trump um, and he's recognized you no know, he gets uh, he, he's introduced in America as Mr. Brexit as the man yeah. as Nigel is the man who uh, brought about Brexit in America which of course is utterly inaccurate he's yeah. one of the players and an impo a very important player in my view um, and, uh, and and probably the most important player actually but he's not the only one and uh, he and he gets he gets the, the acknowledgement the recognition uh, in amongst Republicans, certainly, and, and the Trump campaign, that he's, uh, you know, he, he's, he's not getting here. And, he, and, you know, there is a period where Farage is actually a, quite a, crew, a key player in the politics of this country, the politics of the European Union, in that he's on the front bench of the, as I said, of the European Parliament, would be getting all the briefings, regular meetings with Juncker and other top European uh, officials. Uh, even though the politics is very different, and mm. he's also getting regular access to the White House, uh, and he, and, you know, that he was riding. There was a period of about three years where that was the case. He was he was riding high, but you know, there is always this feeling that you know, a they've got it in for me. They you know they gang up on me, and that's why I can't win a Westminster election. They don't think when I have all this access to Trump, they're not interested in learning from me what Trump has to say. Then they, they won't make me ambassador to Washington. I uh, find I find don't you I find them. Yeah. Michael, I find I find the naivety really intriguing because on the one hand, I mean, I've been very critical of Farage down the years and, and, and tangled with him. But I do think it is remarkable that he's not in the House of Lords. Or maybe it's not remarkable because that's sort of how the British establishment it's tends it's to work. But it, it, sorry, it's striking that when you look at hundreds and hundreds of people, ever larger numbers of people in the House of Lords, all, all manner of people with um, with major achievements, but some with questionable achievements are in the House of Lords. And one of the most significant figures of the last half a century in terms of the uh, political history of this country doesn't doesn't get a look in. So I, I, I even as a critic of Farage, I see that. But the naivety in that period, th the notion that the British establishment, having been given a whacking, by Nigel, Far Nigel Farage, or partly by Nigel Farage, is then going to turn around and say, well, of course, it must listen um, with bated breath to Nigel Farage, Andy Wigmore, and uh, Aaron Banks. It's just self-evidently ludicrous. It's not how the world works, is it? No, I mean, he, you know, UKIP should have been given places in the House of Lords. And I'm not sure, I mean, it would have been a dilemma for Farage if he had been offered I mean, on the one hand, he thinks he should have been offered it. But on the other hand, I'm not sure he would have taken it. <laughs> if, if, if he'd taken it, of course, it would undermine this idea that I'm anti-establishment. I'm an ordinary man of the people and all of this. Yeah. Uh, I mean, a knighthood, I think he would take. But I think it's 50-50 whether he would have taken a place in the House of Lords. And, um, uh, but of course, you know, it then gives him a new platform, doesn't it? And of course, that's what he desperately doesn't have right now. He doesn't have a platform. Yeah. Um, and... Uh, so, uh, but it's absurd. I mean, the house, the way that people get into the Lords anyway is absurd. And most people have bought their places there. And, and, the, and of course, they don't just buy them for the length of a parliament. They buy them for life. Um, and the whole thing is corrupt. But, I mean, the coalition committed itself back in 2011, 2010, to, to ele appointing people to the Lords in the proportion of the vote that they got at the previous election. Well, on that basis, UKIP should have had dozens of peers uh, in the past, and of course, has had none. Uh, yeah. Oh well, one no, one or two, one or two. Yeah. It's hard. But he then, but he then, uh, he's put in a really interesting position because Brexit doesn't go to to plan. Well, was there was there a plan? Speaking of someone who voted for it, they, they they clearly wasn't, and it was a coalition of interests and no agreement about what Brexit would actually look like. The the the, key, the one thing uniting leavers was the desire to leave the European Union, but it all goes spectacularly wrong. May's election um, uh, in 2017 backfires. The negotiations are bogged down, national humiliation, disaster. And that then gives him his opportunity, gives him a new platform. And I remember a lot of scepticism at the time when he founded the Brexit party, but he knew exactly what he was doing. Well, first of all, it was the prescience to see that the way that the talks were going and everything kept being voted down by Parliament uh, would mean that there would have to be another set of uh, European... We would have to take part in this country in another set of European elections. And he 
he allowed, he allowed it, and it was becoming increasingly cheesed off with UKIP because um, uh, it was becoming increasingly Islamophobic under uh, Gerard Batten. And he allowed this woman, Catherine Blakelock, to set up a Brexit party. Um, and then uh, eventually he left UKIP, joined the Brexit party, and then he had to purge her. I mean, Farage, you know, has purged, you know, almost as many people as Stalin. And he, he, um, he, he purged her, I mean, quite rightly, actually, because she had uh, said all sorts of terrible racist and anti-Semitic things on, and I think they are racist and anti-Semitic, on social media. Uh, but what he didn't manage to get was get hold of the levers of the party. So she she had the uh, you know the company the company shareholding the directorship the the access to the PayPal account the access to the bank account, and this trying to get them out of Catherine Blakelock. If uh, the Brexit party very nearly uh, weren't allowed to contest the Euro elections because it was a matter of only a day or two that she finally handed them over all of these levers because she said, well, I want to be a candidate. And Farage said, no, you can't be a candidate. <laughs> but And so she was refusing to hand these over. And it was too late to set up another party and get a, a, a recognition from the uh, Electoral Commission. But you're absolutely right. He saw, he, was, he, he had, a, you know, the strength of, he understood the strength of feeling. And the Brexit party, you know, took up in a matter of weeks <laughs> Uh, and of course, won those elections. Uh, and Farage, you know, has gone down in history as the only man. Not he's not only is the only man to have won a, you know, a nationwide election as a minor party, as he did with UKIP in 2014. He then did it again in 2019 with a different party. And you yeah. can't say that the Brexit Party was, you know, this was UKIP renamed because UKIP was still around and still fighting those. Yeah, elections. but he, and, he, and he, hammered, he and hammered the Conservatives. And, you know, I, I think there were ministers who voted for the Brexit party, frankly. And, yeah. uh, of course, Theresa May, you know, finally had to go. And then the, uh, the irony, he teased it up for Boris Johnson. Absolutely. I mean, there was a period, and you've got to remember, in the, there was a period after the Euros when the, the, uh, the Brexit party were the number one, not just in the Euro elections, which, you know, PR and all that, but they actually, you know, six polls. They were, they were, they were the number one in the polls. And, you know, again, the Conservative Party probably overreacted and uh, were terrified that, you know, he was going to be the, the dominant figure in British politics. And um, but then they lost the Peter Brabai election. And suddenly people realized, ah, actually, you know, if the Brexit Party can't win the Peter, if, a place like a Eurosceptic place like <laughs> Peter, then they're probably yeah. not as strong as you might think. But nonetheless, the, the Conservatives... You know, I think, I mean, early in 2019, Boris Johnson didn't look like he was going anywhere, but he was, the, you know, the Conservatives, A, the Conservatives' answer to, to Nigel Farage, and B, the man, you know, the contender most likely to get Brexit done in a way that uh, Theresa May hadn't. Yeah, uh, it's, of course, it, there it, are great yeah. similarities between uh, Johnson and, uh, and Farage. I mean, they're both, you know, pop star politicians, aren't they? They're the only two politicians, really, in this country that get mobbed on the street. And uh, uh, most most politicians get ignored on the street. Most people haven't got a clue who they are. Um, but Farage and Johnson is, uh, you know, it is like something out of. Um, well, it's like seeing, you know, certain American politicians. Mm. Uh, because, uh, yeah. Uh, you you just meant you mentioned Boris Johnson there being written off. It's a very, very it's a salutary lesson for anyone who covers politics or makes attempts to make predictions about the future you're absolutely right and I can remember it very clearly it was early 2019 I remember seeing Boris Johnson standing we were, we were standing talking a sort of huddle of MPs and, and journalists and Boris Johnson going going past or actually coming over to, to to say hello a forlorn figure lost you know the ex-foreign secretary politics seemed to be passing him passing him by there might be a change of Tory leader but it probably wouldn't go to Boris was was the assumption although the polling of the activists suggested the uh, suggested the opposite and within a year well seven or eight well within six months he, uh, he was prime minister and then within a year he'd um, you know he'd, he'd won a majority of 80 just on the you mentioned there on Farage being uh, you know being mobbed how do you think he responds to being a a hate figure because there will be people watching this who really cannot stand him it's not just not not just critical of his of his, of, of his record and his legacy but really cannot abide farage i th i think actually internally 
he is incredibly hurt by it. He, he, you know, he's a much more delicate person than we might realise. And um, internally, he, when people call him a racist, he, he really, it, it, you know, you can call him anything. You can call him a crook or, you know, dishonest or whatever. But if you call him a racist, that really gets to him because he, he genuinely doesn't think he is a racist. And well, I, I'm, you know, I would I would agree with him on that. And um, and he and he hate you know he does. I mean, being a hate figure, I think it's a bit less of a problem to him in that you know he knows the hurly burly of politics, and he and he knows there are millions out there who love him as well. Um, and um, he loves uh, he loves. I mean, he, the other thing is he hates uh, he, he he is the you know has been the subject of huge numbers of. Um, uh, well, he's had a few attacks on the street and nothing really serious, but he has had lots of threats and he has to go around with bodyguards these days. And it's, uh, you know, it, it, five years ago, he would just walk the streets of London like any other politician. Now he doesn't do that. He's always got men with him these days. Um, and that's not very pleasant. And, you know, he did have a mob that, uh, you know, surrounded him and his family when they went to the pub one one Sunday. Sunday. And, he, you know, he hates all of that. And I think all of that also contributed to his, you know, various decisions at various points to resign the uh, the UKIP uh, leadership. Um, but he loves he loves the engagement. Um, and, and unlike, see, Boris Johnson, I you know I, he, he, he he doesn't really like engaging. He doesn't like engaging with uh, journalists. Whereas Farage loves doing interviews. You know, he loves he'll he'll go anywhere for an interview. <laughs> and he and he's a great he's great to be interviewed if you're a broadcaster. Whereas Boris Johnson avoids any scrutiny of uh, what he stands for and his views. Yeah, um, I remember se- I remember sending in, when I worked on the Sunday Telegraph, there was a Farage story brewing or and, and, and it just shows you how he wasn't taken too seriously that, that a trainee was sent to go and have a pint with him. Someone thought it'd be a good idea to just, you might get more out of him over a, over a pint on a Friday late afternoon. Now, I mean, he he almost um, he almost he almost sort of destroyed the, the trainee who'd never who'd never really young journalist who'd never really drunk at that at that pace, uh, and of course Farage just and Farage just talked away and held court in the pub and gave the interview an interview that was supposed to last one pint lasted for hours and hours and hours and he just wanted to talk and people coming up to him and I don't think it made for a particularly good. Um, piece in the end, but yeah, you're right. He loved that, uh, loved that attention. Is he done? Do you think? I mean, he's now, he's, uh, ma- he's making, quite, he's making a lot of money working for GB News, right. and he's doing various things which I see adverts for. But he, he, so he's cl- he's clearly making back some of the money that he lost by by being a politician and not being in the city. But is that it in terms of politics? Uh, well, it's it in terms of being a player. I think. Um, I mean, there's talk about. You know, trying to get a referendum on uh, net zero, uh, the, the, and, and of course he's still president of Reform UK. I can't see Reform UK getting anywhere. Uh, I mean, they'll get a few votes in by elections, but really because you know the, the the goose that laid the golden eggs has been slain now. Uh, and the great irony, you know, the, no longer have you got these regular five yearly elections to the European Parliament, which really used to give UKIP a new boost. You know, yeah. uh, terrify the existing parties once again. Loads more money brought in. All of that's gone. Uh, you know, you're not going to get very far on PR for the Welsh Assembly or PR for the Scottish Parliament. And um, uh, although they tried, and they're never, you know, very they're never very strong in London either for obvious reasons. Uh, so I can't see Farage getting involved in electoral politics or referendum politics again. But he will be an al- analyst and commentator. And his position currently with GB News is quite interesting in a way, because there he is every night coming out with his views. Uh, but the trouble is the, the audiences for GB News, even for his show, and he's one of the most popular presenters, aren't great compared with mainstream television and radio. And I think that because he's on GB News and thereby committed to one channel, um, other channels don't invite him onto their programmes with the regularity with which they used to do. And I'm not saying they boycott him altogether but he doesn't get the coverage on the BBC that he once used to get. So actually having this slot, these slots on GB News, and he loves broadcasting, and he is a brilliant mm. broadcaster, actually have, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, lessened overall the coverage. And 
quite what's going to happen to GB News. It's difficult to see it surviving in the long term on those kind of viewing figures. And I mean, perhaps there'll be a merger with them and T, you know, talk uh, TV and radio. And uh, um, you know, there's just too many outlets at the moment, frankly, to to sustain it. But uh, he's going to be around. He's only 58. I mean, he looks a bit older, I think. But I mean, he's going to be around for 20, 30 years. Uh, you know, regularly doing interviews, and of course, he does his own social media stuff as well. He's got a, he's got good people helping him with that on Twitter and YouTube and so on. Um, so, uh, what, about, what about his health? Which I wouldn't normally ask about a, a politician, but it's such a feature, and it features in, uh, features in your book. Various things happen to him in health, uh, in, in health terms. Sort of, you know, get some, get some bad luck, and then of course, there's the the plane crash, which we didn't talk about, which yeah. produces. Well, those photographs, which are almost like a like an art installation, the day that the plane crashes during the it's a 2010 election, isn't it? Yes. So he, so he manages to just sort of get away by the skin of his teeth. Well, he's had three near smoking and drinking. He's had three near death uh, moments. He was, you know, hit by a car yeah. and uh, in hospital for weeks after that. He had testicular cancer, uh, and then he had the plane uh, crash in 2010. Uh, which was absurd, really, in that he didn't actually need to go up on a plane on, on, on election day because it was never going to get much broadcast coverage. Well, it was a, it was a, you know, a little, a little plane uh, with a banner. The idea was a banner. We're flying over the Buckingham constituency, but hardly anybody was ever going to cover it, and people wouldn't really see it from the ground. They weren't going to cover it as broadcasters because under the rules they're not allowed to. So it was a it's bit of a pointless day. exercise. And as to, as to why Farage had to be in the plane anyway, we wouldn't know he was in the plane. So it's all absurd. But he came within actually inches of, if, he'd, if his head had hit the ground uh, and it came within inches, then I think that would that would have been the end of him. Mm. Interestingly enough, on a technicality, it might, might have been the end of John Burko as well, because Burko wouldn't have been elected uh, as MP for Buckingham that night. Uh, because the in those days, if a ca one candidate died, they had to rerun the whole election, uh, as happened with uh, Patrick Cormack's seat, uh, I think, at the a previous election. And so Burko, they would have had to have at least an interim speaker. And that was a, a, a period when Burko was a pretty unpopular. He'd only just started being speaker. And I wouldn't have been surprised that they would have taken, the Conservatives would have taken as an opportunity to replace him. Who knows? But, um, yeah, and he had a bad, and that then led to, a, a, you know, back and neck problems, which I think, I think he still has, and, yeah. and appalling pain, which made him really irritable at times. And of course, that irritability showed itself uh, in, within UKIP's internal politics and the appalling rows he used to have, growing rows with the national executive. And he was fed up that, you know, the national executive wouldn't do what he, he said they should. Um, and, you know, contributed also to this you know, wanting to get out of the UKIP leadership and he, he kept resigning and then coming back and it was all very messy. But I, I think, you know, in other ways, his health seems to be fine. I mean, the drinks doesn't seem to make a huge difference to him. And he goes through periods where he doesn't drink much. Uh, and he goes through, you know, he's gone through periods where he's, uh, you know, I think he probably looks, he's a bit slimmer than he used to be. So I would have thought he'd, he'll survive till his 80s or 90s, but we never know. We can all step out on the road and that's that. But uh, yeah, and he can. He, yeah, you're right on the drinking and, side. And, you know, he, he can. He can turn that on and off. It seems. Yeah. He, he and unlike his father, who was a you know a, a terrible uh, alcoholic, um, and uh, he's always going to be a name. He's always going to be to generate. He's now you know he's now making a bit of money when of course he never never really did in the past, and he's got a very uh, modest house in uh, on the edge of Down in you know his the, the, the village where he grew up. Uh, he's also got a house on. Uh, down on the uh, on the coast in Kent, which is why he knows so much about all of the cross-channel uh, dinghy traffic, uh, yeah. because he, he he sees it himself when he walks on the beach in the morning, and he know, and he's a fisherman. He goes out fishing in the middle of the night and everything. He knows a lot of the fishermen, and they tell him the tales. And he's got lots of contacts, and that he really did make that his own issue during the lockdown period, and do lots of videos. And he'll he'll carry on doing if he can pick up an issue, particularly if it's you know related to immigration. I think he will do. And Farage, I think, is has a great uh, nose for public opinion and what and what the public want and will tolerate. You know, and in a way that only two other people, I would say, have, uh, and they would be Rupert Murdoch and and um, Tony Blair. But there, no doubt you can think of. Mm. 
think of others. But I think that has that has helped him uh, at times. He, I mean, he's, in terms of his skills, I think he's the best communicator of our age. In that he's he's good um, on it on every political platform. Some people are good in one ways. You know, like Heseltine was great on a, a, a conf party conference, but hopeless on the street. And yeah. and 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 Farage can do the party conference platform, the telly studio, the radio studio, the parliamentary chamber, and uh, ordinary voters on the street. And not many can do, can do that range. On the other That's hand, good. he's utterly disorganised. I mean, if you think this government is chaotic, <laughs> a Farage government would be an utter disaster in from that point of view. Uh, quite apart from the policy issues. And, um, I'd never, I'd, you know, I'd, 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 ne I'd, ne I'd never considered the possibility of a Farage government. No, no, what no, terrifying no. thought! But I mean, the, the, the chaos within UKIP is is, uh, <laughs> is is all part of the story, and also this astonishing ability to fall out with people. But is it your book? Your book is, I mean, your book is packed with this d detail, which UKIP, and as you, you they, they get a yeah. thank you in the acknowledgement, the the UK, the UKIP archivists gave you loads of detail and colour and record records. So it's all laid out. That hasn't really been done before, has it? It's properly no, mapped out the history of all this feuding and infighting. And... Well, there's a lot more. I could only, um, uh, uh, you know, it, it, it tell some of the stories, but, um, and there's loads of material online and blogs that, you know, have got 10,000 entries and so on, just wading through all of this stuff. And, uh, well, one of the great stories about it is, it, is, the, is the Craig McKinley story. Because Craig McKinley was, um, he and Farage, you know, he's now the MP for South Thanet. Now a Tory MP, yeah. He was the one who beat Farage in 2015. And, um, all, uh, and uh, but he and Farage were both founder members of UKIP. And they were the young, you know, most of the early members yep. of UKIP were at least in their 50s and most of them were much older than that. And, and these were two in the late 20s, early 30s young men. You know, both personal, good looking and so on. And they were sort of rivals, but friends. So uh, McKinley, who's an accountant, used to do Farage's accounts for him. And um, and they both went for the nomination for the southeast area for UKIP in 99. And Farage won, but only by a very narrow margin. And then uh, uh, McKinley got increasingly cheesed off and, um, and left in the end, uh, cheesed off with Farage and left and became a conservative. Uh, and then what happens in 2015 is that it's, it's McKinley against Farage in UKIP. So, you know, one UKIP leader against her, and actually McKinley had been acting UKIP leader at one stage uh, against the other in South Thanet. And after, and McKinley wins, and after the election, I did all this work for uh, Channel 4 about how the Conservative campaign had been uh, grossly overspending on the campaign. And it results in McKinley being in court along with his, uh, a woman called uh, Marion Little from Conservative Central Office and another official. And uh, the Marion Little got convicted and, and would have gone to jail if it hadn't been for the, the fact her husband was ill. McKinley uh, was acquitted. Uh, but he, you know, his wife was pretty unhappy with me for the fact that her husband had ended up in court. And lo and behold, you look see that um, suitcase over there, the, the purple one. That is one of three suitcases of material that uh, Craig McKinley very generously um, let me have of the early years of UKIP when wow. uh, in all the papers that you could you know, possibly want from that period. Uh, and he generously, I'm not even sure if he gave me them or lent me them, but I, make, I, I shall make sure they're preserved. Um, and, uh, <laughs> you know, despite the fact that, um, you know, as a result of my uh, journalism he'd ended up in court uh, but um, so, uh, he wasn't so there is a there is so there's an official history of UKIP for historian to well, write there, which... there is material and there are people trying to put I think the University of Buckingham have agreed to yeah. uh, to set up a Brexit archive and uh, eventually my you know so my stuff will uh, once I've well, it's very important it's always it's very important about how quickly people move on and forget it's very important to capture that stuff at the time isn't it and make sure it's in the right archive because people will this brings me to my final question people will write books about this in 20 years time 50 years time 100 years time asking you know why did it happen what does it what does it mean final question how will impossible to know definitively but what do you think how will history judge farage well i think he will 
he, he'll have a role in history, an important role in history, 50, 100 years from now. I think he will be more of a, a name than, you know, some prime ministers, frankly, I mean, a bigger name than Theresa May. Um, and, uh, you know, and as one of those figures who made a political impact, but was, in fact, there aren't really any other figures who made a political impact and who were never an MP. There are some figures who, um, you know, made an impact without really being in government, like Alex Salmond. Um, and, um, but not even not very many of them. I mean, even, you know, Oswald Mosley was a minister at times. Um, so it, it's sort of those maverick fringe figures. Don't, uh, you think, don't you think the parallel might be John Wilkes in, in that Wilkes is still talked yeah. about and is seen as really representative of enormous changes happening in the period in which he lived. And I, I wonder whether Farage, actually, ironically, as you say, eventually even most prime ministers are forgotten, but I wonder if in a couple of years, a couple of hundred years time, Farage will be emblematic of huge changes at the end of the 20th century and early 21st century. Possibly. I mean, there are there are parallels with Wilkes. I mean, Wilkes had a very colourful um, uh, private life and, uh, and and so on. I don't I mean, I don't I mean, I, I don't know uh, enough about Wilkes uh, compared with you, but I mean, I know a fair bit, but um, I don't think Farage is an, an intellectual figure in the same way that Wilkes was. Um, and he's not a great writer or, um, he's, you know, he doesn't read, he doesn't read books, Farage. I mean, he's a clever man, very clever man. And, pe and people think he knows nothing about policy. Actually, he does know a lot about what's going on uh, policy wise, but he's not, um, he's not a great, you know, ideas man. He hasn't, he doesn't, you know, you can't, he's not like sort of Joseph Chamberlain who represent, who espouses a certain, uh, yeah. you know, a, 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 a range of ideas and so on. Um, and, there's no, th uh, there's no, there's no theory. He represents an instinct, doesn't he? As a worldview, a way of thinking about the world. But, uh, but, but uh, you know, as a colourful, as a colourful representative of the early 21st century, and I think we are now moving into an era where political figures won't necessarily have made an impact through the house, through, through Westminster, until, till really 20 years ago. You had to you had to be a Westminster politician, frankly. Um, uh, and now, because we've got these ex important assemblies, Scotland and, 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 and Parliament, Scotland and Wales, and we've got all the mayors around the place, it, there are alternative career routes. And you've seen, um, uh, and, you know, when we'll no doubt see Burnham and uh, Khan trying to become Labour leader before long. Um, and you've seen, and of course, Doris Johnson became prime minister, having been mayor of London. I think we're going to see more and more of that, a bit like governors trying becoming presidents. Whereas in the past, it was assumed you had to have a great Westminster career to make an impact in British politics. And Farage shows that's no longer true. Yeah. And he's part of a generation, really, of politicians who may have been in that of sort of outsider. You know, so you've got Galloway, Livingston, um, Salmond. Uh, Sturgeon, some of the Irish ones uh, who have uh, and some of the mayors that are, are starting to emerge that are actually um, not Westminster politicians. Some of, even when they've been at Westminster, they haven't enjoyed it like or, or participated properly, like like Livingston and Johnson when he was a, just an ordinary MP. Um, and so it, it's it's changing the career patterns and uh, and the dynamics and actually making it rather more exciting uh, than than uh, than we've had for 300 years. Politi politics is changing and Nigel Farage has certainly, love him or loathe him, has made things more exciting in the last 25 uh, years or so. Michael Crick, thank you very much for joining us. We've been talking about uh, Michael's book, One Party After Another, The Disruptive Life of Nigel Farage. Thank you, Michael. I'm Ian Martin, editor of Reaction. You've been watching Authors in Conversation. Thank you for joining us.